Hi, welcome to this week's message from Calvary Baptist in Lake Havasu City. Today's message is based on Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 15, and it's all about freedom. The Life Notes are available to download from calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here is Pastor Robert Smith. Well, you can go ahead and have a seat. If you've got a Bible, you can open to the book of Galatians chapter 5. It's where we're going to be today. If you uh, don't have a Bible with you or Bible app on your device, uh, you can uh, find Galatians 5 on page 1,157 in the the seats around you. And as always, if you don't have a Bible, we'd love if you would take one of those home with you today so that you can read and apply God's Word because we know that if you do that, it will change your life. And hey, as you're getting tuned er, tuned in or turned in or whatever word that I'm trying to find there, uh, if you find your spot there, uh, I want to ask you a question as you, as you find your spot, and that is, what has been your favorite moment of freedom? You know, we're reflecting on, on freedom as a nation, and as we look at Galatians 5, we're going to be talking about freedom today. What was your favorite moment of freedom? Maybe it was when you turned 16 and you finally got your license and the keys to a car. How many of you remember that day as you uh, went for a drive with uh, hopes to not return anytime soon? Um, <laughs> Maybe it was when you got your first job and you had your own money that you could spend on whatever you want and then you realize that that comes with bills and it's not so fun after all. Uh, Maybe it was when you graduated from school and you were done with all the classes and assignments and homework. Any uh, recent uh, Havasu graduates in the room tonight? It uh, doesn't look like it tonight. They're, they're celebrating. A couple in the back. There we go. Uh, maybe it was moving out of the house and, and no curfew, no house rules, and you can do your own thing. Maybe that was your moment of freedom. Maybe yours is a little heavier. Maybe it was walking out of prison after serving time and being free. Maybe it was finally being free from an addiction that, that enslaved you for years. Whatever, whatever it is, the, the cheers, the, the excitement, or even just those fond memories of, uh, of remembering that first drive on your own or whatever it might be, freedom is something that we all love so much. And, and as, a, as a nation, we love this. And, and I love that whenever uh, conversations of other nations come up, it always comes back to, well, what freedoms do they have compared to ours? And their liberties and, and possibilities as people is always a point of contrast between them and the United States. And so this weekend, as we as a nation are pausing to remember the men and women who gave their life to, to earn and defend the freedom for our country, I think it's fitting that we find ourselves in Galatians 5 talking about the freedom that Christ has for us. And this freedom is so much more powerful than the freedom uh, to drive wherever you want or to stay up as late as you want with no curfew. It's so much more powerful than any of that because Christ has brought us the ultimate freedom, which is the spiritual freedom that we have in salvation. As we're going to see in in Galatians chapter 5, that brings just incredible good news to us. So let's take a look. Galatians 5, starting in verse 1, it says this. Paul opens up right from the top. He says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And he goes on to, to say, show us where this takes us. He says, Look, I, Paul, say that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again that every man who accepts circumcision, that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You were severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. He says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. For if you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. He opens up with this great news, for freedom Christ has set us free. And the good news that we get to reflect on today is the fact that we are free in Christ. And this is incredible news that permeates the entire New Testament that Jesus came to bring freedom for us. 
Even as you look at, at Jesus from the very beginning of his ministry in the, the book of Luke chapter four, one of his first public moments of teaching, he gets up in the temple and he grabs a scroll to do the reading in, there in the temple and he opens to the book of Isaiah and he, he shares a prophecy, this prophecy about how one would come to set liberty for the captives and to bring liberty for those who are oppressed and he finishes reading it and he says, today this is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus came to bring freedom See, Jesus himself says in John chapter eight, he says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. The Holy Spirit inspired the application of the New Testament, the writing of the New Testament, and in it it says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. All throughout the New Testament, we see this common theme that Jesus in his work for us brings freedom in our life. But freedom from what? Well, first, the, the thing that Jesus brings freedom from, first and foremost, is the curse and condemnation of sin. Because we are all people who are sinners in need of grace and salvation, and Jesus came to set us free from that. As we as sinners are all under this, this weight of sin that, that without Jesus, we can't escape from. And Jesus actually says in John 8 there that whoever practices sin is a slave to sin. We're stuck in that. But Jesus sets us free. From, from the day-to-day -day struggle against that and, and the, the, the never-ending defeat that it brings, but also the eternal consequences. Uh, Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That, that we, because we are people who are rebellious and sinful against a holy and perfect God, have earned a condemnation of death, not just the physical death, but eternal condemnation because of our sin. But Jesus came to bring freedom from that, that we no longer are, are defined by our sin and rebellion. We have the hope because Jesus has forgiven us and given us a completely fresh, clean slate without the sin and condemnation that we earned ourselves. And so we have this incredible freedom in that, but as we have been talking about religion over the last several weeks, and as Paul is trying to help us and the people he's writing to in Galatians, we also understand that this is also freedom from this, this tug of religious living. The idea that we have to do the, the outward external things. The, the idea that, that our life is to be lived with some man-made rules and and this need to follow the law and do all the things. And he's saying, hey, don't go back to that yoke. Don't put that weight back on yourself, this weight that you need to follow the law and do all the things, because he says, guess what? You didn't do it that good anyways. He's like, you couldn't follow the law, so why do you think that, that following all the rules is going to get you salvation in Jesus? Because you messed it up on your own the first time, which is why we need Jesus. So we're free from the, the condemnation of sin. We're free from this burden to follow all the rules of religion. But we have to use that freedom and we have to find that freedom in surrendering to Jesus. See, I think it's so interesting that the thing we want so much is freedom and yet the way that we get it is by surrender which is typically the giving up of freedom, typically the laying down of freedom. But in Christ, it is actually the way that we find it. Because in Christ, when we surrender our life, when we surrender our future, our hopes, our goals, uh, the direction of our life to Jesus Christ, and we say, you're going to be the one leading, and we surrender, we find the incredible freedom he has for us. Our life, then, is, is found in the incredible grace and hope of Jesus, and we are free from all the things that weigh us down. But as we read through this, we see that that isn't the end of the story because there are things that continue to wage against this. In verse seven, he says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? He said, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. He's saying this, this pull away from grace is not from God. And he goes on to just talk about the condemnation and the, the, the desire he has for these people to, to be punished. But what he's showing us here is that there are battles against our freedom. The very things that we are set free from continue to wage war against the freedom that we have in Christ. For Paul, the very first thing that, we're, that he addresses in this battle that's continuing to be there, he says, you're set free from the law, and yet the law in this religious thinking continues to wage against the freedom you have in Christ. There's this continual struggle that we as people have to, to think that religion is what saves us. 
and that we need to do more of those things. We need to try harder. We need to work more for our grace and forgiveness. We need to do more external religious things. And, and it kind of makes sense because we see some benefit from those things. We start reading the Bible and we start obeying God's word and we start doing the external acts of obedience to follow God and we start seeing our life get better. As we obey God and apply his word, our life is blessed. And I think somewhere inside we cross the wires and we go, well, it's me doing these things that's blessing my life. And we start thinking, well, I'm just gonna fix more of my life. I'm gonna do more. I'm gonna make my life better before God. And we end up worshiping our own self instead of worshiping the one who saved us because we want to fix it. We want to do the, th the things ourselves. We don't want to realize that we are weak and can't do anything our own. And at the end, if, if we step back from it, it doesn't make any sense. Why would doing more external religious things fix it? If we understand that the problem's on the inside, why would doing more stuff on the outside fix it? If we understand that our problem is a sin and heart problem, why would looking like we have it all together on the outside and, and being regular in church and knowing all the right answers and doing all the right things fix what's broken on the inside? And it won't. It can't, which is why he keeps pointing us back to Jesus, which is why Jesus is the only way to freedom, not our own actions. And see, Paul's writing to a group of people that was wrestling in this tension of Jesus plus religion. And for them, it was Jesus plus the Jewish laws and customs. And we've talked about this a few points, but, but he gets very direct and bold in this. And he's saying, hey, these people who are trying to make you believe that you need to follow Jesus and you need to do all the Jewish religious things which for them is following all the food laws and ceremonial cleanliness, but also the outward external uh, indicator of this through circumcision. He's like, hey, those people that make you believe that that's what you need, he says, I wish they would go all the way and just cut the whole thing off. If they say circumcision is that good, take the whole thing off. That's in scripture, that's in there. <laughs> and see, he goes to the extreme to show that it doesn't actually do anything. He said, if, if this is so good, take it to 100%. Don't do it part way. And he does that to show that this external religious behavior doesn't actually do anything. All it does is keep us stuck in this yoke of slavery, but with Jesus, we find freedom. Freedom is only found in Jesus. It's not in the external stuff. It's only in a life-changing relationship with him. So we're set free from religion, but we're also set free from, from the sin tendencies and they continue to battle against us. See, we all come to Jesus, like I said, in sinners, as sinners in need of grace and forgiveness and sanctification. We all have that in common, but each one of us have our own unique struggles and temptations and desires for sin. We all have our own flavor of sin, you might say. And while we are set free from the condemnation of that, and while we have the ability to find victory over that, sin continues to battle against us in our life and try to pull us away from the life that God has for us. And, and if you've ever felt like, man, why can't I just break free from this? Then I wanna read what Paul says in Romans chapter seven to, to maybe help you understand that this is a struggle that is common to us as followers of Jesus. Paul says this, he says, I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. See, if we're following Jesus, this struggle against sin is something that is always before us. It's always in front of us that we have to be conscious of and continue to build up walls against that temptation. And the way that we battle against those sin tendencies, the ways that we battle against the tug back into religious thinking is through the truth from Jesus. See, in John 8, that, that famous conversation where Jesus is talking about freedom, he says these words, and maybe you know it. He says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We love that, don't we? We love that reminder that the truth will set us free. But we have to understand how Jesus presents that to us. The way that we get the freedom is through his truth. 
It's not our truth. It's not the truth that makes us feel good and feels right in the moment, but it's his truth that comes from God's word the ultimate source of truth. And the way that that we get that freedom is applying his truth, which is what he started with. If you abide in me, if you connect yourself to me, if you're constantly dwelling and remaining in me, as some translations say, he says, then you will be my disciples. See, I wonder how many of us want the freedom that Jesus describes here without the process of submitting to his truth. I wonder how many of us want the freedom that Jesus offers without the regular act of surrendering and abiding in him and becoming his disciple. I wonder how many of us want the freedom that Jesus offers in scripture without the cost of being his disciple. Because discipleship is not an easy or or pain-free endeavor. It requires sacrifice and commitment. It requires being uh, countercultural and going against the grain of everything that's around us. But when we abide in Jesus and we are truly his disciples and we know his truth, the truth will set us free. So today we need to remember that the freedom that Jesus offers us is not found in any other way except surrendering to him as our Lord and Savior. And so if you're here and you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and Savior of the world, that he lived a perfect and sinless life, that he died on the cross for you and rose three days later, and you've committed your life to following him, then you have the wonderful freedom that he has provided for you. And we then get to say, okay, how do we be people then who are living in freedom? If we've believed that, if we've surrendered to Jesus as our Savior, if we believe these wonderful truths, how do we be people who are living in freedom? Let's look again at how Paul closes this section of Galatians. He says this, he says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. See, we're told here that that freedom isn't to be used to, to gratify our own desires. It's not this blank check that we get to use to do whatever we want. There's freedom, but there's a purpose for that freedom. And it's interesting, he says, hey, it's not here for you to, to gratify the desires of the flesh. And if we're curious on what that is, we can skip down to verse 19 where Paul describes the acts of the flesh before he describes the fruit of the Spirit. And he says this, he says, now the works of the flesh are evident. They are sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. That's not a very good list. That's not, if you're like, oh, I do that, I do that. You should, you should come back to the start of this and surrendering to Jesus. See, Paul says, hey, the, the freedom that, that Christ has awarded you is not to be used to feed your flesh. So what are we to, to use it on? Because obviously not for that list here. So what do we use the freedom in Christ for? And the first thing, I've got three things. They're not in your notes, but if you want to sketch them down, there's, there's probably room for you. But there's three things we can use our freedom for. And the first is to love and serve people. See, Paul uh, addresses that right off the top. He says, you are called to freedom. And he says, use your freedom through love to serve one another. We are are called to love and serve people with the freedom that God has given us. And as you read the Bible, as you understand God's word, as you understand the life that Jesus came and lived, you see that loving people is central to the message of everything. As we understand, hey, what am I supposed to do as a follower of Jesus? Love and serve people. What is a church supposed to do? Love and serve people. How do I interact with people in the community? How do I interact with people who don't know Jesus? You love and serve them. How do I interact through conflicts? You love and serve people. It all comes back to that. Because Jesus loved and served us. Jesus demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans tells us. And our goal and our desire is to imitate the life and behavior and decisions of our Savior Jesus. And that means that first and foremost, we need to be people who love the people around us. And not just love the people that we like. That's the easy thing but we're called to love the people that we don't like. 
We're called to love that family member who drives you nuts because he makes terrible decisions. You're called to love that annoying person at work who always gets on your last nerve or creates four times more work for you. You're called to love the person who makes your life really difficult and annoying. It might be your spouse, and if so, <laughs> don't point him out. You're, you're called to love the person who you think votes differently than you or thinks differently or incorrectly. You're called to love the people that you think are ruining your city or your nation. You're called to love the people even who have caused harm and hurt and difficulty in your life. See, Jesus said in Luke chapter six, he says, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. He goes on to describe that if we're going to follow him, we need to love our enemies and do good to them. So how are you doing at loving the people around you? Do you want to dismiss them because they're different, because they're wrong, because they've hurt you, because they're annoying? Are you willing to love the people around you as Jesus loved you even while you were sinning against him? And see, the way that, that we do that is by serving people. It's not enough to just to say, oh, I love people. I love the people around me. How are you serving them? See, Jesus didn't just come and teach all these wonderful messages about how he loved us and then went off into heaven and say, have a good day. I love you guys. But he demonstrated it. He served. He served his disciples, even Judas who betrayed him. He served people by, by feeding and healing and meeting their needs. But really, he served us at the most by going to the cross and sacrificing and enduring incredible pain and suffering as a way to serve us. So how are you serving and loving people around you? See, we believe that this is so important for us to live out. That's one of our church's core values, radical service. Because we believe the best way to demonstrate the love of Jesus is through acts of kindness and service. But that's not just something that our church does and you get to get a pass on. It's something we all as followers of Jesus have to live out. So are you serving people? Are you putting other people's needs ahead of your own? Are you using your time, talents, and treasures to serve people and demonstrate love to them? Because it's what God wants us to use our freedom for. The second thing that we can use our freedom for is to choose grace over legalism. So there's an interesting statement at the end of, of this section. In verse 15, Paul says, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. And, and as I read that, I couldn't help but think about the different ways that, that Christians get legalistic and judgmental towards others, and they start biting and devouring each other with, with judgmental comments and harsh criticism and rebuke about how people are living their lives. And see, we have grace and freedom in Jesus. And as we look at God's word, there are instructions and wisdom and commands all throughout Scripture. And some of those are very direct and explicit and detailed instructions that we're to follow to a T as best as we have the ability. But then there's other areas that, that there's freedom in how we live that out. There's freedom in, in listening to the Holy Spirit as he uniquely gives each of us individuals instructions on how to follow them. But what happens is we start wanting to be the verbal Holy Spirit in other people's lives, telling them what it means for them to follow Jesus. And I want to look at a few of these that I think are, are common throughout the, the, our culture as it pertains to Jesus followers or where we get off of this. And, and the first is in alcohol use. Now, I'm not, it'll start on the top here. I'm not promoting alcohol use. I'm not saying, hey, Pastor Robert said to get a beer after, with dinner tonight. That's not what I'm saying here. But in Scripture, we see some, some instructions like Ephesians 5.18. It says, do not get drunk with wine for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And large portions of American Christianity and really global Christianity have used that to, to beat up on people and prohibit any alcohol use whatsoever. And, and, and make statements like, if you even think about drinking alcohol, you're sinning. And yet they forget that Jesus' first public miracle was turning water into wine at a wedding ceremony. He didn't turn it into grape juice or Coca-Cola. It was wine. Even in the New Testament, uh, the Apostle Paul is, is instructing Timothy in the book of 1 Timothy to drink some wine because he's got this stomach ailment. He's like, hey, drink some wine. It will probably help you. 
And so maybe instead of a legalistic, judgmental approach, there's freedom for each of us to make our own decisions with the overarching reality that if we're getting to drunkenness, we're in sin. See, there's freedom in how we do this. There's, there's also legalistic uh, attitudes towards clothing, and this is mostly towards uh, the ladies. Sorry, I don't have a lot of uh, experience with guys judging other guys for how they dress. It's not as common as you ladies. But see, they, they might take verses like uh, 1 Timothy 2.9 that says, likewise, women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control. It's a broad statement. They were to dress with modesty and respectable apparel. And yet I've heard so many Christian women judge other ladies for the, the apparel that they wear and make statements that, that are incredibly condemning and judgmental as if there's a Christian uniform that we're all to adhere to because they've chosen legalism, not grace and freedom. There's even in the entertainment industry with the music and movies that we listen to and, and statements like no Christian should ever watch that movie or, or no Christian would ever listen to that music. And there's, there's verses that give some broad instructions. Uh, Psalm 119.37 says, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things. And give me life in your ways. And don't we all want to turn our eyes from looking at worthless things? But there's not a list of movies that are prohibited in scripture, or music genres, or artists that we're not allowed to listen to. And yet, so many times people get legalistic and want to act as the Holy Spirit. And this wouldn't be complete without talking about how we spend our money. Because there's so many Christians that will say, well, no Christian should ever spend that much money on that item or earn that much money. I don't know how many times I've heard someone say, well, think about how many hungry kids in Africa could have been fed with how much they spent on that car or that item. And the Bible's full of, of financial wisdom, of how we're to live with generosity and how we're to tithe and give God 10% of our income as a way to obey and worship him and how we're to save and be wise and, and maybe even instructions on budgeting and planning. But there's not a, a first and second budgets book that tells us how much we're allowed to spend in each category. But instead, there's freedom in us choosing to obey the Holy Spirit's direction in our life specifically. And what I'm getting at here is that we have this pull that we have to drift to a place of wanting to judge and condemn others for living different than we think they should. And we, like I said at the top, we want to be the verbal Holy Spirit for other people's lives, telling them this is the right way to follow Jesus. And we forget that there's freedom in Christ. That freedom doesn't mean we get to ignore those instructions of Scripture. It doesn't mean that we get that blank check that we get to spend however we want. But there's freedom for us listening to the Holy Spirit and how he desires for us to follow those more general instructions in Scripture. And so if you've been in that place of judging and condemning fellow believers around you, let me encourage you to choose grace over legalism and understand that we are all sinners trying to do our best to follow Jesus. And in those moments where you feel tempted to speak up, remember the words of Jesus and take the plank out of your own eye before rebuking them for the speck that's in theirs. So, choose grace over legalism. Finally, as we live in this freedom, let me encourage you to choose joy. See, as I love that the sermon started with, with just encouraging cheers and excitement about this topic of freedom because the fact that Jesus came to save us from our sins, that he loved us is incredible good news. And the fact that God wants to be with us every day, helping us, guiding us, encouraging us, teaching us and blessing our life further adds to that good news. And yet there's so many Christians that live angry and grumpy in the face of such incredible good news. Jesus says this in John chapter 15. He says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. Jesus wants us to have joy that is full, not partial, not inconsistent, not wavering, not temporary, but full and complete joy because there's incredible good news that he loves us. The God of the universe cares about us specifically. That in the, 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 the scope of human history, the, the thousands, the millions of people that have existed, God cares about you specifically. That even though you have sinned and rebelled against him, he loves you and forgives you and offers grace to you. This is incredible good news. 
And I wonder if the thing that we need in the, the face of the anger and stress and frustrations and burdens that we have is just to remember the truths of God's word. The truths that God of the universe loves us and saves us. The truth that this life is not everything. And so when things get difficult here, we have the reminder that heaven is our destiny and our destination and is so much better than anything here. The truth that in the end, God wins and he uses all the painful and difficult and tragic things to work together for our good in a way that we can never understand in the moment. Truths like the fact that Jesus' work on the cross completely and totally forgives us and changes our life and we don't have to do a thing except accept it as a gift. And these incredible truths hopefully lead you to a place of joy and gratitude because they're truths that are available for all of us. And they're freely available for us just to accept as we surrender to Jesus and receive his freedom. See, today as we celebrate and remember freedom as Americans, I hope that the freedom you have in Christ is far more significant than a three-day weekend. And I hope that as you reflect on the freedom that Jesus has for you, it would encourage you to further surrender your life and live for him. But let me ask you, are you living in the freedom that Jesus has for you in the right way? Are you living your freedom in a way that exists to love and serve people? Are you using your freedom to show grace rather than judgment and legalism? Are you using your freedom to show joy and gratitude in Christ? Because when we know the truth of God's words, it will set us free. So this weekend, as we remember the freedom we have, I hope that you reflect on the freedom that Jesus has for you and the freedom that, that Christ won for you on the cross and that ultimately you would live well in that freedom. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the freedom that we have in you, for the freedom that we have in this temporary dwelling place in America too. God, we thank you for that. But God, we know that the freedom that you have called us to is so much more significant than anything we can build or, or achieve here on this earth. And God, I pray that we would be people who use that freedom well. Let's not use that freedom to rebel and to, to live foolishly, but God, we want to use that freedom to love and serve people, hoping that in doing so, more people would come to the saving faith of Jesus. God, let us not get to the place of of judging and condemning others, but God, help us to live with grace and encouragement. And God, in the midst of all that, we pray that you would help us just to have complete and full joy, even when our circumstances are difficult, even when we struggle, even when life is hard, God, remind us that you win and you have built a wonderful, perfect dwelling place for us in heaven, a place that is devoid of any suffering or pain or loss. And that is the hope that we have in you. So God, help us to live in the amazing and perfect joy you have for us as we live in your freedom. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Galatians 5.1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Paul points to two ways we live in freedom, loving people and prioritizing grace. I encourage you to think of some ways to grow in these areas of your life. If you'd like to support the ministry of Calvary, I invite you to visit our website at calvaryaz.com. There you can follow us on our social media platforms, learn about upcoming events, view or listen to past messages, and give to support us financially. Thanks for joining us today. Have a wonderful week, and we look forward to having you back next week. Bye-bye.